For a graphic illustration, you need go no further than a lonely bus stop in the early morning hours or an underground parking lot of the kind that you find throughout Canada's cities and suburbs. Is there a Canadian woman alive who doesn't feel a tightening in her throat if she's alone in a place like this and she hears the echo of footsteps other than her own or sees a movement in the shadows and puts her keys between her fingers or starts fumbling in her purse perhaps for a pepper spray or a knife that's been given to her by a concerned husband or father-in-law, boyfriend or girlfriend? Help will not get here in time even if someone hears her cry out or hears her car alarm. And yet if she's carrying so much as a corkscrew or a letter opener with the intent of defending herself, she's a criminal in the eyes of the law and so is the concerned friend, relative or lover who gave it to her. Why? Why is it not her choice what she should carry to deter an attack or fight one off if necessary? And the police may say, look, the assailant, if you carry a knife, is just likely to get it from you. But how are you worse off if he does than if he has the weapon he brought and you didn't have one to begin with? And why isn't it your decision? It's just not fair. Even if there might occasionally be an incident where a woman used pepper spray on someone who wasn't trying to attack her, how much fear and anxiety and how many attacks are successfully carried out because the law says a woman doesn't get to decide for herself what might make her safe as she goes about her business, including maybe going to work, shift work at some odd hour and finding herself alone in a place like this with no help on hand and no right to protect herself. At some point, it is surely clear in places like Canada and Britain that there are vanishingly small gains to be expected by proponents of gun control from any further restriction on firearms in terms of reducing the crime rate, reducing the suicide rate, any of the other things they think might happen. Isn't it time just to come, to come right out and say, as Alan Rock did, that you think only the state should be armed? It's remarkable the way that Canadian authorities interpret and try to apply the law if you do exercise your right to self-defense, particularly using a firearm. There's an amazing story of Ian Thompson, lived in Port Colborne, Ontario, and he was awakened one night. Masked men were throwing firebombs at his house and shouting death threats. He called 911. He's a licensed firearms instructor. He went and got a handgun from safe storage. He went outside. He fired three warning shots. The men fled. They were later apprehended. They were tried. They were convicted and given two years in jail for, among other things, indifference to human life. But the police swooped on Thompson. They seized his firearms and ammunition. They charged him on four counts of improper use of a firearm, of pointing a firearm and unsafe storage. Of course, the first two charges were dropped in a hurry. It's hard to imagine a more appropriate use of a firearm, including very restrained. He did not fire at his attackers. But they persisted in those charges of unsafe storage for two and a half years on the grounds that during the incident he had the gun and the ammunition out and not stored. And therefore they jumped to the conclusion that of course he hadn't had them safely stored previously. He was eventually acquitted. But think of the ordeal that he went through. The time, the expense, the uncertainty, the strain on your nerves. The difficulty going on with other activities while this is hanging over you. And for what? What did he do that gave the state any grounds for thinking that he was a bad guy? It's far too common in Canada in cases of self-defense, especially but not exclusively using firearms. And it's high time the government stopped treating the law-abiding as criminals when they protect themselves from actual criminals. I've been running a gun business for oh, almost 20 years and it didn't take me long to start to realize that the overall theme or intent of these laws that we're being subjected to seemed to be of the intent to disarm the good Canadians of this country. Any of the firearms owners I know are very law-abiding, good citizens. I started protesting in 95, shortly after Bill C-68 came into being. 98, the protesting got quite a bit heavier. 2001, went on Parliament Hill, burned my license. I refused to register my guns. I also refused to renew my firearms license and my business license at that time, partly because the authorities were telling me I had to become a police officer and investigate all my customers that come in and make sure that they were complying with this law that I don't agree with.
the business continued surprisingly enough for almost two years before just out of the blue they decided to arrest me. I was taking my daughter to a gun show. Uh, I was helping a friend out at the gun show and we were just there walking around through the gun show and that's when they decided to arrest me and left my 12 year old daughter abandoned alone at the gun show. So she called my wife who then abandoned the house, came down to figure out what was going on and then they arrested my wife as well. So the house was now empty, they could proceed to do the search warrant on their own. When the charges happened and the big raid happened, it was a very stressful time for my family. I just kept thinking, well, they're gonna realize who we are and that we're not murderers, we're not hurting anybody, you've not threatened anybody. I was even afraid at one point that my children would be taken from me because they made the comment and there were children present in this home that had firearms. And wow. <laughs> Yeah, it was a pretty emotional, stressful time. Uh, and I guess it continued for the next 10 years. <laughs> what I thought would happen when I was challenging the law like this was that, you know, worst case scenario, if I lost, I would be given a slap on the wrist and maybe given a fine and be sent home and they'd return all my property. I was a little bit naive. You know, the judge made that quite clear during my sentencing hearing that I you know, he needed to make an example of me because this is not how Canadians are supposed to fight a law. I got a year and a half in prison, plus a year house arrest when I got out. Plus they've seized all my property, lifetime ban on firearms, uh, and they've taken away my ability to have a livelihood. That was a long ordeal. Uh, you know, 2004, September 11th, 2004 is when I was arrested. 2007, we had our trial, finally after you know, many years of delays. 2008, I was sentenced, went to jail, we appealed. I was released on bail while we were waiting for our appeal. We went to appeal court would be, I believe it was the fall of 2009. During the appeal court, I thought we lost miserably on all counts. Um, but our, our lawyer pointed out that we did make a significant victory. The court finally agreed that them taking all of my property, the firearms, the ammunition, was a punishment. That was my life savings. So we had about roughly $150,000 worth of stuff they took. None of it was illegal, but they took it and they were gonna destroy it. I don't have any money stored in the bank. I don't have a retirement savings plan. That was my retirement savings plan. Store up firearms, keep it as a hobby, and sell them off as I get older. And the court did reluctantly agree that yes, indeed, that was a punishment, but in my case, that was justified, I guess. They, they ruled that I would never get it back. And uh, 2010, I had to go back to uh, prison. That was September 2010. And then by January 2011, I was released on parole. We've had two lawyers die during the course of this case. Well, it's gone on for 12 years now. And we're still fighting for the house. The, the, Government of Ontario, the Ministry of Attorney General, I think it was late 2005, decided they wanted to take my home because it was either an instrument of crime or proceeds of crime. I'm not sure which, they're being rather vague. This is 2016 and it was just a couple of weeks ago, uh, mid-May, we signed an agreement with them to uh, have the house released to us. It's funny you mention the legal fees. Um, they didn't come out of my pocket, they came out of donations from citizens across the country. It came to almost exactly $250,000, quarter of a million bucks. Uh, the Canadian Constitution Foundation has taken up our case, which we're very grateful for. They're doing a great job. But yeah, it's, uh, it's wearing. It's really, really wearing. One of the things we were considering arguing is that we have a right to a speedy trial. We could have fairly easily at the beginning and had this whole thing thrown out with just a minor slap on the wrist, but then we would have lost the constitutional challenge. We have a right to life. And what good is a right to life without a means to defend that life? We also have a constitutionally protected right to life. And it's stated in our constitution that we adopted, the English Bill of Rights. We adopted that in 1867 when we became a nation. And the seventh article in the second section states that the subjects may have arms for their defense. We brought up the, the 1689 Bill of Rights in court. The Crown laughed at it and tried to slough it off and move on to another point. Uh, you know, it was brought up 
in the ruling to say that we did bring up that issue, but there was no reason for why it's not part of our constitution right now. The constitution's not here to protect the government, it's here to protect us. You, know, you would think there'd be some sort of at least a referendum by the general populace before an important right like this could be given away. If you look at my rulings, they totally ignored the constitutional issue that was at hand. It just says, nope. And the Supreme Court of Ontario, their phrase that I like to quote is, we disagree. That was their total extent of their scholarly input into this whole issue. They came into my home. They, they threatened our family unit by su suggesting that my children shouldn't be present in such a home. If you're not a gun owner and you're afraid of guns, you don't like guns for whatever reasons, our situation should still matter to you because you don't have to own a firearm for this to happen. A mere phone call from an angry friend can spur the same raid on your home and you can still go through everything we went through. It was shocking that that could happen in our country. We have a right to own our firearms, a God-given right and a constitutionally protected right to own and use our firearms for self-defense. Don't be apathetic, don't sit back. If you see a good cause out there, if you're not brave enough to stick your neck out yourself, support the people that are brave enough to stick out their necks.